So what is strong and what is weak? The early church faced a dilemma. In the time of Jesus, the common expectation was that the Messiah would be a hero. He would be a victorious fighter who defeats the Romans and restores Israel as a free and independent country. Jesus did not really do that. He died painfully on the cross, and the Romans were as powerful as they had been before. They still collected the taxes, they still executed troublemakers, and they picked the high priest who presided over all temple affairs. Is the crucifixion really an act of power on the side of the one who is crucified? Many people had difficulties believing that. Instead, they thought, that looks weak. And many early theologians went to great intellectual gymnastics to explain away the allegedly weak performance of the Son of God on the cross. And in today's imagination on what the second coming looks like, the same problem of weakness seems to persist. Many people think that when Christ comes back at the end of time, then he will be a divine warrior who tramples the unfaithful into the dust, and by doing so, he will make up for his failure to jump off the cross the first time and hit his Roman guards and the Sanhedrin over the head with it. We still have problems seeing the cross as an achievement. When we look at our text today, we discover that Jesus considers many things to be strong which we consider to be weak. How on earth can the poor consider themselves be blessed or the hungry or the weeping? And why on earth should I love my enemy? Usually, enemies are hated. Bless those who curse you, and when you are mugged, give the mugger even more than the mugger demands. That is absolutely counterintuitive. That is not what we consider strong. That is what we consider weak. Let me tell you a story. In 1930, Mahatma Gandhi wrote a letter to the Viceroy of India. He announced that he would walk from his ashram to the Arabian Sea to make salt. In British India, the colonial power had a monopoly on making salt, and so Gandhi's march to the sea was illegal. He was defying, and at the same time, he was challenging British rule. And at this point, the viceroy was smart enough to ignore Gandhi. But as soon as Gandhi left his ashram and started the 250-mile-plus journey to the sea, the New York Times published daily bulletins about his progress. And the journey turned out to be a triumphal march. Wherever Gandhi appeared, the people celebrated him. And still, the viceroy was smart enough to ignore the affair and not go and arrest Gandhi. And while Gandhi was about to disrupt history, he also assaulted Indian sensibilities. He spent the nights in the homes of the Dalit, the untouchables, instead of in the high caste quarters that were prepared for him. And when he reached the sea, he picked up salt and called on the people of India to boycott British salt and to go to the beach and make their own. And the Viceroy of India was smart enough to shut up and not arrest Gandhi. And so Gandhi raised the stakes and declared that now he would seize the salt works of the Harazana. And now the Viceroy arrested him. With Gandhi in jail, his followers went without him. They went by the thousands, and British police and military awaited them. And without even raising a hand or in defense, the activists let themselves be beaten by clubs and sticks. Help us carry the wounded back from the fray, patched them up, and then they literally got in line again to be beaten up by the British. And all that happened in front of American newsreel cameras and newspapers. 
And this atrocity led to a worldwide outcry as the British Empire showed the world its true nature. The British Empire was the strongest and biggest empire the world had ever seen. It was unmatched in military pride and economic power. But as it mercilessly bashed defenseless Indians on the head, it beat itself out of existence. After Dharasana, the empire was basically history. The question was not, would it crumble? The question was only, when it would collapse. World War II gave the British Empire a last breather, but after the surrender of Germany and Japan, Britain was finished. The sun never set on the British Empire, but it crumbled because some people turned the other cheek. Some of Gandhi's fellow freedom fighters suggested that the British imperialists understood only violence, and that to achieve Indian freedom, the British needed to be killed and bombed and destroyed in any way possible. I wonder if Gandhi would have followed that advice and tried to blow up the British Empire, it might still be around. India and Pakistan are part of British India and they separated after independence. And both nations, the people there, are not particularly peaceful people with populations that are relaxed and open to diversity and hard to enrage. No, no, no. They are full of hotheads and nationalists and radicals, and they are armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. Violence is part of their political posture, as it is with most countries on this planet. Kashmir is a stone of contention, and India and Pakistan have fought several wars of it. But despite nuclear armaments and war, the Kashmir question is as unresolved as it was when the British left. Violence solved absolutely nothing. Nonviolence expedited the British Empire onto the trash pile of history. Same people. Different concepts of what is weak and what is strong, and different results. So what is weak and what is strong? When the Christian martyrs were led into the arenas of Rome, they started to sing and to accept their fate with dignity and with grace. And the masses who came out to see a spectacle of blood and guts saw dignity and grace that flew in the face of their celebration of violence. The martyrs didn't scream, they didn't fight, they didn't run around in panic, they simply died in the hope of life eternal in Jesus Christ. For the Romans, it was not fun watching them die. Because violence is what the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, is all about. Violence is what the martyrs defied in the arenas until the Christian spirit took over all of the citizens of the Roman Empire. It seems to me that what we usually consider strong and powerful might not be as strong and powerful as it looks. Violence and bullying look like viable options to get what you want, but if you look at history, more often than not, they only perpetuate the status quo. True change is seldom achieved by something that we consider strong. Gandhi is just one man, not really big in stature, not wealthy, no weapons and no army with tanks and nukes, but he became the nightmare of British imperialism. And the poor itinerant preacher from Galilee who died on the cross even defied death. When they hit him on one cheek, he turned the other. When they killed him on the cross, he came back from the grave. And since that time, Christians have hoped that death is not the end of the human life cycle. Jesus' death and resurrection is what we remember when we remember the saints. Jesus also offers hope for the hungry. They will be filled even 
when that looks unlikely in the light of how things usually work. The poor will receive good things, the prisoners will be liberated, and those who think they are the kings of the world will have to think again. God has a special preference for the poor and who are all who suffer and grieve. As we are agents of God's grace, it is through us that the hungry are fed and the grieving are consoled. People like Gandhi give us courage and the assurance that one old person of color can change the world with nothing but determination. God gives us a mandate to follow in Christ's footsteps. Christ crucified as so shows us that God's ways will prevail even, even if that is hard to believe. Let's be realistic. Suffering is hard, hunger hurts, poverty destroys the human soul, and the wicked often thrive more than they should. Bad stuff happens to good people, and the universe showers the scoundrels with blessings. But realism is not what drives us. We are Easter people. We are people of the resurrection. We are inspired and called by the hope that where Jesus went, there we will follow. Armed with that hope, as the martyrs were in the arenas of Rome, nothing, nothing can defeat us. Through Christ, there is always hope. The kingdom of God calls us to work towards a world where peace and justice reign. It often seems like a dream, a figment of pious imagination, but we have more agency what we think because there is great power in love and in grace. Great power. Turning the other cheek is not a sign of weakness. Poverty does not testify to the fact that the universe favors someone else. Luck, power, and wealth can evaporate quickly. The only thing that is sure in this world is God's love in Christ. And with that love and grace. And with a little bit of resilience, creativity, and courage, we can move mountains. Amen.